In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this year confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the Word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I said steadfast love will be built up forever. In the heavens you will establish your faithfulness. You have said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David my servant. I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. And now in unison we pray the Kyrie. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. The Lord be with you. Let's pray. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come and help us by your might, that the sins which weigh us down may be quickly lifted by your grace and mercy. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading assigned for today is from 2 Samuel chapter 7. Now when the king lived in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, therefore... Thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. 
And violent men shall afflict them no more, as formerly, from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle is from Romans chapter 16. Now to him who is able to strengthen you, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed, and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God, be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the first chapter. Glory be to thee, O Lord. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth is in her in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. And now, having heard God's word, we confess our Christian faith together, and we do that using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
And so again, for the next year, we're going over these texts from the Old Testament that uh, talk about the promises of God. And, um, and today we're going to use a text, uh, again, not from the readings, but uh, from uh, the Old Testament, the book of Genesis. And uh, this is about the, the testing of Abraham, which we can all relate to now. He was tested to, you know, to give up his son, which uh, was nothing like the test we're going through right now, right? With that, yeah. So you know, everything has to be put in perspective, right? There are worse things happening in the world right now than that. So we'll figure that out. But uh, so we're in that, uh, in, in that uh, Genesis 22 text. And we'll let's put this up here on the wall, and uh, let's go through this. And it's a, it's a lengthy one, so, so hunker in, but it's, it's just so important, and that's what we're going to talk about. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son. I will surely bless you. And I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So grace to all of you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. There's a scene from the movie, the the comedy, Coming to America, where uh, at a party they're having at a house, an announcement is made that two young people are engaged to be married, and this is all good and everybody's excited at the party, uh, except for the fact uh, that one person is not excited because uh, the bride-to-be has not actually been asked by the groom-to-be, and she's just learning about this uh, through this announcement at the party. So one of the people in attendance at this party is the family's pastor, and he takes a moment to very emotionally and effusively congratulate her with these words. He says to her, I want you and that boy to tie that knot. I'm going to pray for you, and I want you to hold on to God's unchanging hand because he helped Joshua fight the battle of Jericho. He helped Daniel out of the lion's den, and he helped Gilligan get off the island. Now, which one of those three is out of place? 
Yeah, Joshua and Daniel, true stories that are told and referenced in the Bible. Gilligan is a fictional character from a television show in the 1960s, but unfortunately, I think that joke in that movie gets, a, gets at a bigger truth that people actually have as they look at the story of salvation, as they look at Scripture as the Word of God, or maybe not as the Word of God in some cases. And it's that attitude that says, well, some of this might be real. I'm sure a lot of it's just allegorical, allegorical and, and there's a whole bunch of weird stuff in there we're not really sure about. And I think this text in Genesis is a very good way of our God saying to everybody, Hey, this story, this whole story of salvation as found in my word is for real. This isn't some made up thing, but all of this stuff actually happened. Because if the Bible is God's word, which we believe, and and it's written so that we can know him and know his plan of salvation and what our relationship with him is supposed to be like, the near sacrifice of Isaac tells us that this is for real. Because if you were making up a story it doesn't seem like a great idea to include this in there if you want people to like, believe in, and trust in the promises of this God, right? But what is going on here is real. This actually did happen. And this text is one of the most powerful ways that God communicates a message to you and me about why we should love and trust and believe in this God and no other God. So last week we talked about Abraham. We talked about his call from God to leave his home and go to a place where God would use Abraham to bless all of the families of the earth. Now, Abraham himself would not be that blessing, right? Only Jesus the Christ could be that blessing to all the world. But it was through the lineage of David, the bloodline, that God was going to bless the earth. And there was just one problem at this time, right? At the time of the call of Abraham, he was about 75 years old, and he and his wife did not have children. They seemed kind of past their, you know, shelf life of of childbearing time. But what happens? Miracle of miracles, and God blesses them with the gift of a son named Isaac. Now, essentially, these promises of God made to Abraham fell into these three categories. Let's put them up on the wall. Land, family, and blessings for the world. So there was the promise of the land. Hey, I'm going to take you out of your home here, or I'm going to lead you over to the promised land. There's the promise of the family. Through your descendants, we are going to have, you're going to have so many descendants you can't even count, okay? And then through those descendants, the world is going to be blessed. Now again, in each of those cases, the promise was based on the premise that Abraham would have descendants. Abraham and Sarah, I want to emphasize that, and Sarah had to have a son. The Lord made it clear that only their son could be the child of the promise, even though they tried to take matters into their own hands and make the promise happen on their own. And that's a whole other sermon, a case where Abraham is an example, do not follow this and do not do things this way. So finally, their son Isaac was born. Think about how happy they would have been. They'd waited so long for this child. They had waited and prayed about, and and now here it is. And so much depended on, because not only that, you know, we have this uh, message from God to them that, hey, I'm going to do great things through this son. So everything God had promised was riding on Isaac. And now what does God say here? Kill him. Doesn't it look like God is going back on his word, taking his promise back at this point? But we know that this is the test. Okay, Abraham was being tested by God, but the sinful world in his sinful nature was being tempted to do something else, and that is think that the Lord's promise was worthless and that his situation was hopeless. So he had to do a little bit of comparison and contrast here because the promise of God said that God loved Abraham and it singled him out as a conduit for the blessings of all the nations. But the world was saying something else, right? The world he lived in, lived in saw Abraham as just one of many, many people on the face of the earth and not particularly special. So why should he listen to the promise? Okay, the promise of God said that from this boy Isaac, a multitude of descendants would be born. 
Look at the situation here in the world. It seemed Isaac was not going to have any descendants. So again, he has to go to his inner soul and say, why should I listen to the promise? The promise from God said that the Savior would come from Isaac. How could that be when this situation right in front of me says that the promise is going to die with my son? Again, wrestling with that question, why listen to the promise of God when it doesn't make any sense to what you see right in front of you? Now, that is something that you and I have to wrestle with, is it not? Our faith does not exactly go through the same test as Genesis 22, but it is tested in this world. And we can do that very thing where God has promised us numerous things, and we look at the world we live in and we say, why should I trust this promises? Why should I trust this promise or these promises? Okay, we look at ourselves and we say we're small, we're insignificant, we don't really matter all that much to God. Why would he care about us? We get self-centered at times. We are slow to give up our conveniences and we have a tendency to put our trust in things that we can see rather than put stock in things that we cannot see as promised by God. So again, that question comes to you and me. Why listen to and believe in the promise? And here's why we should. Number one, we have the history of the world to look at, to see how our God has made promises throughout the whole course of human history, and we can look and see how he has kept those promises. We can also look in that word number two and see that God does this very thing of testing to his children whom he loves, and he does this for a very, very good reason. It isn't some kind of sadistic thing that he likes to do to his children with all of the power he has. He tests you and me to make us better, make us stronger, and draw us closer to him. And this is where Abraham is a good example of faith in the middle of testing. He set out to do what God asked him to do. And at the last moment, God stops him and prevents him from doing this thing. And I think we have a tendency to just kind of look at stuff. Well, it's in a book, all right? And I just read 18 verses of it. I can close that book. I can put that book up on the shelf, right? Because we've read it, it's in a nice, tidy little compartment. But you and I know that life doesn't operate that way. If somebody were telling a story about us and what we have gone through, you know that there are ramifications and after effects of the situations of life, right? Right? I was watching an, a movie interpretation of this scene, the near sacrifice of Isaac, and they showed how when this was all over, and Abraham walks Isaac back home, and they bump into Sarah, uh, who knows what's going on. Isaac runs into her arms, and he had been getting along fine with dad up until that point and stuff, but as he's doing this, he kind of glances back at Abraham with a look that says, I can't believe my dad almost just did that to me. And in this scene, Sarah wasn't very happy either. There's a sense of like, okay, uh, you know, this is, this is kind of weird. There's a tension here. And I think that that's probably a realistic interpretation of their relationship. But as he's doing this, he kind of glances back at Abraham with a look that says, I can't, this isn't Thanksgivings. We're pretty awkward at the dinner table too. But, you know, what we need to understand is that there are far, you know, farther reaching effects in, in these things. That's what Abraham was willing to go through, and that's a good example for us. And it was a close call. We need to understand that. Pre appreciate this leap of faith that Abraham took here, because when God asked him to do the unthinkable, he went for it. But God didn't force Abraham to follow it up to its completion. And this is where the whole thing turns. This is where we see something miraculous as the story unfolds. And I'm not talking about this little Genesis 22 sliver. I'm talking about the whole story, all capital letters as it unfolds and what that means for us. One time at Family Devotions, Martin Luther read this scripture to his family. And after he got done reading it, his wife Katie was very upset. She actually burst out and said, I don't believe this. She couldn't believe that God would do something like that, ordering a man to kill his own son. She thought the very idea of God suggesting this was cruel on the part of the Lord. And she said this to Martin, God would not have treated his own son like that 
And Martin simply told her, but Katie, he did. And this is where the story gets so important for you and me. And I want you to think about that. What God wouldn't put Abraham through, he was willing to go through with his own son. And that's what happened at Calvary 2,000 years ago when Jesus was on the cross. God killed his own son. There was nobody there to shout stop when Jesus was being crucified. In fact, it was just the opposite, was it not? He was abandoned. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in fact, the way that God would bless the world through the lineage of Abraham was because of what took place on Good Friday. When it came to the father and his son, he did not call off the sacrifice. He was going to keep his promise to the world made all of those years ago when we fell into sin. He promised that he would save us, and on the cross, he proved that to the world. He kept his promise to you also in this brutal way because he wanted you and me to know how serious he is about being faithful to us. On top of that, we have our brother Jesus there who willingly becomes our sacrifice so that his father's promise would be kept. You know, I love this uh, sermon series that Dr. Sherb has written, but there's a quote in this that I want to put up on the wall. This ought to be on coffee mugs and hats and bumper stickers because it's so important. Everybody ought to know this. He said, at the cross, there was no one to take Christ's place. He was taking our place. No ram in the thicket is delivering Jesus of Nazareth out of this sacrifice. God's own son died taking your place for your sins. God was keeping his promise to the world. And that's why this is such a great text for this time of year. I mean, Christmas is so close, we can taste it, can't we? We can smell it. And what is the whole point of Christ coming to the world that first time? Just to go take a trip and see what this is all like? I want to test drive the creation? No, he came to pay for the sins of the world. But Christ did not come into a world of gingerbread houses and shiny lights and silent nights. He made all of that enjoyable for you and me, our lives better for sure. But what he had to encounter was not a holiday. He came to suffer, to make the promises of his father a reality. And that should not be lost on us as we celebrate and have joy and appreciate what God has done for you and me through the baby in the manger. You know, one of my favorite Christmas songs is sung by Julie Andrews, and I'm comfortable enough as a man to, to admit that. Julie Andrews is one of my favorite singers, but uh, it's, on one, it's on a Christmas album of hers. It's called The Lamb of God, and uh, it is a great reminder of the season or the reason that we celebrate at Christmas and the Christmas child, but these lyrics say this. I want to put them up on the, on the wall. She sings, awake, awake, you drowsy souls, and hear what I shall tell. Remember Christ, the Lamb of God, redeemed our souls from hell. He's crowned with thorns, spit on with scorn. His friends have hid themselves. And here's the kicker line. So God send you all much joy in the year. Yeah, you won't hear that one at Target. But this is our God. What he is willing to go through for us is the ultimate sacrifice. And why is that? Because our joy... The joy which we are called to live in, the joy that there is because our sins are forgiven, the joy because heaven and man have been reunited, that joy is important enough to him that he sent his only son. And that's why we need to focus on what is really going on here in the text of Genesis 22. Again, a lot has been made about Abraham's faith and trust in God, and you got to hand it to him. He is pretty faithful here. But the faithfulness of Abraham is not the main point of all this. The promise of the Most High God is the most important thing in this text and in the entire story. God's promise to his creation is the greatest thing happening here and forever and ever. And at the end of the passage, the angel of the Lord reiterates this, right? He doesn't say, hey, way to go, all right? But he does after he, I guess he gives him a little bit of an attaboy there, but he re reiterates the main point of all this, the promise that God had already made within the call of Abraham, and that's what? In Abraham, specifically in his offspring, all the families of the earth would be blessed. This was the promise of the Christ child, the promise that Jesus, by his life and death, 
and resurrection would save his creation. And that's what our God is all about, his guarantees. And this season is all about his promises being kept. You know, if I could go to another uh, Christmas song that I love, it's from the Trans-Siberian Orchestra, and it says this. I love this line. Christmas has its promises to keep. That's what this is all about. The birth of the Son of God through the line of Abraham is proof that our God is all about keeping his promises. Wouldn't it be a shame if we didn't use this gift? It would be. So take all of the fulfillments of God's promises and put them into your lives. Live in them. Cling to them in faith like Abraham did. We have a God who forgives our sins. We have a God who has created us and the world and keeps us alive. We have a God who raises his people from the dead. He is a God who can be trusted. When everything seems hopeless, the Lord comes through on his guarantees. So God bless us to live in the power of the promises of God. Today, tomorrow, for every day of our lives until we stand in his presence. Amen. Would you please rise? Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty God, you have blessed us with the incarnation of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. In everything, let it be to us according to your word. Give us faith to believe that nothing is impossible with you and teach us to pray boldly and with a childlike confidence. Heavenly Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, you have revealed the truth of salvation. You have brought that saving message to the ends of the earth. Bless all of your churches that they would be rooted in and guided by your word. Strengthen your people in every place, Lord. Hear our prayers on behalf of our nation, its president, all legislators and judges, and those newly elected to serve. Preserve their lives and guide their actions for the good of our people. Give peace among the nations of the earth and preserve us from pestilence and famine, war and bloodshed, sedition, rebellion, and every form of evil. Most high God, look with compassion on the lonely, the depressed, and the despairing. Grant healing to the sick and give peace to the anxious and dying. Lord, we ask that you would continue to be with Paul Vondeber, Jeff Bowl, Josephine Mancini, Mike Stagnolia, and Lorraine Sandage. Be also with all those who feel the physical, mental, emotional, financial, and spiritual effects of the pandemic. Be with healthcare workers, Lord, who are working so hard on our behalf. We also ask that you comfort all those who mourn the death of a loved one at this time. Comfort them with the certain hope of the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come made possible by your son. At this time, we ask that you would be with the families of Jim Rowe, Dorothy Schmadeke, Mary Roberts, Floyd Bertoni, and Charles Stokel. At this time of year and always, Give us thankful hearts for all of our blessings, but especially for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. By his death, he has opened the kingdom of heaven and closed the gates of hell for all who trust in him. By his resurrection, he has rescued the prisoners who sat in darkness and in the shadow of death. Bless us to live in the life and light that he brings to this world and keep us ready for his wonderful return. We ask all this through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen.
Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen.